And without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker. David Brady is an associate professor of sociology and public policy and director of the Center for European Studies at Duke University. His research has focused on poverty and inequality, politics, work and labor, and globalization, and he routinely teaches courses on the global economy, poverty and inequality, organizations and management, and research methods. He is the author of the upcoming book, Rich Democracies, Poor People, How Politics Explain Poverty. So from Duke University, please welcome Professor David Brady. Uh, thank you for having me here. Um, just a couple preliminaries. Please feel free to interrupt me at any point if you have any questions or there's anything that needs clarification. Uh, my students always joke with me that I have a really bad habit of drinking too much Diet Coke and it shows up in how fast I talk. And so I, I encourage them, I welcome them, I, I, I celebrate their interruptions because it, it keeps me on task. Uh, secondly, please feel free to call me Dave or David, either one is fine. And uh, Please uh, let me know if there's anything that's unclear as we go forward. Okay. So I thought we'd start with something really uh, pretty relevant to many of our lives and look at what's called a commodity chain of where your blue jeans come from at Walmart. And this figure I should note is from a friend and colleague named Jennifer Baer, who is a terrific sociologist at University of Colorado. And this is based on research she's done where she goes and interviews people in the factories that produce the blue jeans that sell in Walmart. And so what she shows us here is we have three kinds of arrows. The black dotted lines are the flows of the orders from the retailer, in this case Walmart, to the manufacturer or from the retailer of brand to manufacturer and so forth. The solid black arrows are from the, the flow of materials from the suppliers and the manufacturers to the factories. And the solid red arrows on the outside there, you'll see, are from the, the flow of the final finished blue jeans to the retailer, all right? And just looking at Walmart, only a sample of the products that they sell, we get a really clear sense of the diversity and the heterogeneous sources that are driving our global economy, all right? First of all, Walmart has a direct buyer of its own clothing line, which we see over here as the U.S. manufacturer, and that produces its own clothing line, which is a unique thing that's really only occurred in the past 15 or so years within manufacturing. And these jeans are called, I believe, Route 66. And Walmart has several different suppliers for Route 66. There's not just one factory. There's not just one company. Um, one of them is a company that has been named uh, Sun Apparel, and that was recently bought by a U.S. brand named Jones of New York. And this, owns, this company, Sun Apparel, owns a factory in Mexico, which is called Maquillas Pami in the north central region of Mexico. Walmart also buys Levi's, which you see in the center of your figure there. And as you may know, Levi's has eliminated its domestic manufacturing in the past 20 to 30 years. They used to produce all of their jeans, I believe, in upstate New York. Now none of them are produced here in the United States. And these jeans are now basically contracted to a group in the Dominican Republic. And it's a Dominican firm called Grupo M. Grupo M purchases Mexican-made denim, which was produced with thread manufactured in South Carolina and cotton grown in Texas. The materials go to Grupo M's factory in the Dominican Republic, where the rolls of denim are rolled out and they're cut into different pieces that will later be assembled into the jeans. They then take all these pieces, ship them to the other side of the island, to, to Haiti, where the labor costs are much lower. And there in Haiti, they do a lot of the assembly um, and in this export processing plant. Um, um, and the assembled jeans are then sent back to Grupo M factory in Dominican Republic, where they go through the final processing, such as stone washing or fading or various colorings that you might see in your jeans. Finally, they're sent via container ship from the Dominican port of Santo Domingo to the port of Miami, where they're also sent over land to a Walmart distribution center. Now, finally, and just mentioned briefly, Walmart also places orders with a Taiwanese company named Nian Xing, I think that's how you pronounce it, um, which is now the world's largest manufacturer, not just of blue jeans, but also of denim. And most of Nian Xing's manufacturing, even though it's a Taiwanese company, most of the manufacturing takes place in China. And those products as you can see, are partly assembled from materials from India, cotton from India, thread from China, and denim from China. And so you have this amazing matrix of global 
forces that are coming together just to produce the blue jeans that maybe many of your students are wearing in the classroom. Although I don't know if Walmart jeans are too uncool for high school kids. Maybe they're not. I don't know. But I, I assume that even the Gap probably has something like this similar commodity chain. Okay. So today I want to use that as just a metaphor to think about the global economy. And I want to hit five major questions that we can think about as understanding and giving a big picture presentation to animate and orient our understanding of global, the global economy that you folks will be talking about all week long. So first, what is globalization? What do we mean by this fancy term? Secondly, what are the trends in globalization? What really has changed over the past 20 to 30 years? Third, I want to talk about what I would call traditional global inequalities, inequalities of our global economy that have existed at least over the course of the 20th century, if not longer. Okay. Third, I'm going to talk about some newly emerging global inequalities, because one of the unique features of the recent wave of globalization is that what's creating inequality has really changed, and the division of labor in our global economy has truly changed really since the 1970s. Uh, fifth and finally, I want to see if there's any real possibilities for global social justice. If you study this kind of work, it's often easy to get very pessimistic, very cynical, very skeptical about the possibilities for worldwide poverty to be reduced, for well-being in developing countries to truly improve. I'd suggest there are many ways in which we have seen progress, but we still face some major obstacles. And we'll discuss what are some of the venues, the avenues that we can potentially see progress in this regard. Okay, so let's talk first about what is globalization and talk about a few of the core ideas. When I refer to globalization, I would talk about the growth of the connections that span space. So whereas you might have had a traditional industry, for example, that was based around Detroit, say automotives, you would have suppliers, you would have parts distributors, you'd have vendors, you'd have all pieces of the industry within a very tight geographical space. Nowadays in the global economy, these connections span much greater geographic distances. And this, as a result, compresses the world that we live in. We have a much tighter connectedness between vast geographical distances, and this also reduces the, the influence of international barriers on all kinds of processes. Moreover, I would say that you could think of globalization as sort of the growing irrelevance of geographical distance. I mean, nowadays you can make a phone call to anywhere in the world, five, ten cents a minute, maybe with a one dollar connection charge, and it is almost if data, communication, many resources can flow across vast geographical distances, and those distances are not that consequential anymore. Okay? Moreover, I think we can think concretely of globalization as the growing flows across national borders, specifically things like people, what we know of migration, capital, financial transactions, as well as investments that flow across distances, as well as goods and services that flow across distances. Um, and beyond that, we can also note that this, this, these flows that we're seeing growing in the global economy, they're increasing in rapidity, they're happening more often, they lead to an increasing integration across places, and they include a greater share of the world's population. So find in your mind the most remote geographical location you can imagine, and there's many ways in which it's still linked to other parts of the global economy at vast geographic distances, and it would not have been so prior in the 20th century. Okay? Now, when we speak of globalization, often scholars refer to sort of the eras of globalization or the waves of globalization. So I think it's helpful to talk about the timing of globalization as we talk about it. The first wave is typically considered to start around the 1500 or the 15th century. Uh, many people just uh, talk about the age of rediscovery or the age of conquest, with Columbus finding the the west, re, rediscovering the Western Hemisphere, and that coincided with the rise of capitalism. So prior to the 1500s, we'd probably call this world economy a feudal economy. Certainly not clearly a capitalist economy. Me. But after that initial burst of globalization, many of us would date the rise of capitalism right along that period of time. Now, that earlier wave arguably peaked in the early 20th century prior to World War I. Okay? We saw levels of trade between countries that were quite high by historical comparison. So early 20th century, prior to World War I, we had you know, massive migrations of people here to the United States. Many people in the United States date their ancestors coming to the U.S. around that turn of the century migration flows. I know my grandfather went through Ellis Island, for example. And that was really a peak for globalization. Over the course of the 20th century, 
century. After that, you actually saw a substantial decline of globalization. These flows, these connections, these interconnections actually went downhill, especially with the Great Depression. And it was only after World War II that we sort of mounted a steady creep upwards in terms of global interactions. The recent wave, the one that I'm going to concentrate most of the talk on, really begins with the early 1970s. Okay? In the early 1970s, you saw lots of changes. Um, we abandoned the fixing of the dollar to the gold standard, okay? saying that each dollar is worth so much in gold, and we started to allow the dollar to float. So you had the floating exchange rate started to emerge. We also had big changes in the early 1970s. We saw the sort of the decline of the U.S. economy really started to begin in the 1970s. Up through the 40s, 50s, and 60s, the U.S. economy was booming, and we really somewhat reached a plateau starting in the 1970s. Others would point to the first oil crises that occurred in the 1970s. So for the first first time, developing countries could say, we've got these natural resources and commodities that you really want, we're going to control the supply of those. And that really changed the power dynamics of our global economy. So the early 70s were a very cure period for the start of something new. Okay? And to give you some vision on what this looks like, this I think is a pretty good rendition of what the early wave of globalization looked like at its peak. And here is a picture uh, showing a map showing the steamship routes that were occurring around 1900 all over the global economy. And you could look at this picture and you could say, hey, you know, that's a pretty global economy. We're pretty interconnected. And you could say, well, potentially globalization is not such a new thing. But certainly steamship routes did link distant outposts of the global economy with the rich, affluent democracies, although in some cases they weren't democratic yet, but Western Europe and North America were certainly connected with places like Sub-Saharan Africa, as well as South America, East Asia, and so forth. But the type of globalization that was occurring there was very different from what we see today. I mean, it took a long time to take a steamship across the Atlantic or across the Pacific. And if you're changing goods back and forth, I mean, this is an incredibly slow incremental process. Communication took a long time. So there certainly was interconnection, but it was a much more uh, slow, slower-paced interconnection that occurred. Now, as a metaphor, if you will, for the recent global economy, we can take a look at the picture of the Internet. And this is a simulation. I'm not quite sure how they do it, but it gives you a picture of what the Internet looked like in basically 2002. All right, and what we see is, you know, you'll see some regional nodes, little tight clustering of connections within certain regions of the global economy. But overall, this entire monstrosity we call the Internet is pretty massively connected, right? It wouldn't be that hard to find some spot and maybe through five or six connections reach pretty much any spot in the world. You know, and these, these network scholars, they work on things like the small world problem, lots of my colleagues that study social networks. And, they, and you know, Kevin Bacon is right, or this theory of Kevin Bacon is right. There really are something like six degrees degrees of separation with almost any person in the world. And I have colleagues that they do the math on this. And they'll sit there and they'll project. And they'll say, well, really, how many degrees of separation between somebody anywhere in the world? And it really is something like six degrees. And it does connect to everybody in the world. And something like the internet, I, I think, gives us a metaphor for thinking about how globalization is different in this recent wave. Because compared to steamship routes, this stuff these flows go really, really rapidly, right? They can happen instantaneously. You can have video. We saw this in the past few weeks. Video that's put on the web by protesters in Iran being downloaded here in the United States immediately. And the traditional media outlets, as far as I can tell, are way behind the game, okay? So they're sort of, you know, telling us, I think it's one of the more absurd things to watch CNN and have us tell us what the blogs are telling them. So, you know, I, I don't quite understand the media's role within that, within that phenomena. But they're covering, uh, you know, I don't know, you know, the mom with the 10 kids really, or octuplet mom really, really well, but they have to go to the blogs to cover what's going on in Iran. And so it really gives us a metaphor, very, very different kind of global economy from the steamship routes we saw at the beginning of the 20th century. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about some definitions to give us some concreteness to this. First of all, we talk about globalization, I like to think of four dimensions in which we can think of globalization. First of all, there's diffusion, and this is the active dissemination of practices, values, and products throughout the globe. Okay, so when something diffuses, we would say that there's this active dissemination. Somebody is pushing a model onto the world. Hollywood diffuses its media products throughout the global economy, right? So diffusion is the active dissemination of whatever it might be. It might be a practice, it might be a policy, it might be a set of values that get disseminated throughout the global economy. Secondly, we have interdependence as a dimension of globalization. And this is the reciprocal, meaning two-way effects 
of actions across borders. So interdependence is the interactions across borders. And what occurs in one venue affects what also occurs in the second venue. And they, they go back and forth. Okay, So there's certainly reciprocality. Third, there's organization. We can think of globalization as the activities and institutions that are governed by the global norm, the transnational actors and entities that have big influence on the global economy. And I'll identify a few of those in just a moment. So the organizations of the global economy are quite salient in understanding what's going on. And fourth, we could talk about global culture. All right? And there's certainly, I think, in the US economy, as well as in other parts of the world, an increased awareness of the unity of the world. There's increasingly shared beliefs about certain scripts that all countries are expected to believe in. Whether or not they do on the ground, they, they certainly share a rhetoric of these scripts. Okay? It's interesting that Iran is having a democratic election. I think it's sort of a, a stretch to really say that Iran is a truly democratic country, but it's interesting that they feel obligated to engage in the global cultural script of having a democratic election. They have voting processes, they talk of freedom. The discourse they're using is something that's united across the global economy, and that does reflect a unique globalization of culture, whether or not on the ground practices are different from this global culture. Okay. Um, and one good example of this is a picture I've got here of this is actually a small town in India that is one of the, 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 uh, the stars from Slumdog Millionaire, where he's from. And what you see here is a bunch of kids crowded around a TV station or a TV that's propped up on a chair, and they're celebrating one of these stars from Slumdog Millionaire winning an Oscar. Okay? And so I thought that was a pretty good example of the globalization of culture, the fact that this small town, which we'll see, South Asia is still a very highly rural part of the world, you see this, this interaction with Hollywood and big global American culture. All right. Now, concretely, we can also talk about economic aspects of globalization. And like I said before, I like to think of globalization as the flows, everything, whether it's products or people or ideas that are disseminating across national borders or across geographic space. So concretely, we're, here we can talk of the flows of goods and services, the flows of people, which amount to labor, as well as information and capital across nation states. And specifically, this can include things like the international trade and investment. When we talk about the flows of goods and services, that would be exports, where there are outward flowing goods and services. So when China exports toys to the United States, good example of exports. Imports are the inward inflow, inward flow of goods and services. So when the United States imports beef from Brazil, that would be a classic case of an import. We can also talk about direct and portfolio investment, which are increasingly important alongside exports and imports. And inward foreign direct investment is a firm in a foreign country buys a controlling share of a firm in your country. Okay, So when, for example, Honda builds Hondas in Maryville, Ohio, that's inward foreign direct investment. Outward foreign direct investment gets a little bit more attention, and that would occur, for example, when a firm in your country, here in the United States, invests a con in a controlling share in a production or facility in another country. So if GM puts up a plant, as we see in this picture here in just a second, of the GM producing Buicks in Shanghai in 2007, that's a good example of outward foreign direct investment. Also, we should note portfolio investments. And portfolio investment are all these international financial flows that don't amount to a controlling interest. So we distinguish between direct investment, where somebody is really trying to get a stake in a company, trying to invo be involved in the management and control of that company, and portfolio investment, where they're just speculating. They're throwing money at something, trying to see what happens, get the money in and out. So a great case of portfolio investment is the case of Iceland port having its banks, all of its pension funds, all of the towns in Iceland putting all their money in mortgage-backed securities here in the United States. And if you follow Iceland, which, you know, probably doesn't get a lot of news, um, but Iceland has really been devastated by the global economy in the past year or so. I mean, probably more than any other rich democracy, I would say Iceland is in the deepest trouble. And Iceland completely bought in. They went all the way, man. They said, you know, the U.S. economy, it's dynamic. Let's get in all these mortgage-backed securities. If you can figure those out, Good for you. I can't figure them out. But they poured a ton of money in. Their towns were putting their pension funds in. Everybody under the sun in Iceland had money somehow in the U.S. economy in these mortgage-backed securities. But none of it was about controlling shares. They weren't trying to take over Bank of America and tell it how to, what to do strategically. They just were speculating and putting short-term and quicker investments. Now, all that portfolio investment, that's certainly globalization, but it's not like GM building Buicks in Shanghai. All right, so we have different kinds of investment, and that can be quite consequential. 
Lastly, we could also mention migration, which is simply the movement of people and labor across borders. And as we all know, this has been a big feature of the global economy, certainly uh, in the United States as well as elsewhere. Now, uh, also speaking concretely, let's talk just for a minute about some organizations that are heavily involved in globalization. And I'll just mention a few. There's a whole bunch. We could talk all day long about organizations that are involved in the global economy, but I want to mention a couple to give you a sense. Uh, first, there's a couple key global actors. We could mention the United Nations, for example, as a global actor involved in the global economy, but I'll mention two others. One of them is the International Monetary Fund, which was founded after World War II, in, and this was right after World War II. The, the leaders of the surviving rich democracies, the United States, Britain, they got together and said, well, we need a set of institutions to coordinate our global economy. We just saw what happened with the Depression. Let's come up with some infrastructure to govern our global economy. The IMF was one of the big ones. And the IMF's job was to be headquartered in D.C. Its goal was to ensure that there were stable exchange rates. So nobody's currency was plummeting or skyrocketing or what have you. You had cooperation and coordination. But it also was supposed to be a credit rating agency. So its job was to say, hmm, you know, stock markets, I'm going to give Brazil a rating that's mediocre and tell you, I don't know if you want to buy Brazilian real these days because the Brazilian economy is a little bit skeptical. Interestingly, despite this mission of being a credit raging agency, it started to take on the job of lending money. So the IMF really got in the business of loaning money to developing countries to help them balance out their exchange rates. And again, you know, Sabina uh, Sheikh is going to talk in a minute about uh, Econ 101. Maybe she can explain exchange rates. It's, it's, a lot of it's hard to understand. But when a country gets in trouble, somebody like the IMF steps in and says, we'll give you a loan. But here's what was unique about post-1970 in the IMF's role. They said, we'll give you a loan, but we're going to dictate some terms. We're going to tell you in Indonesia or in Brazil or Argentina, we're going to say, well, we'll give you this loan and we'll help stabilize your currency, but we want you to privatize your public works. And I understand in Chicago here, they privatize parking meters. Is this true? So we're talking about this. So imagine you're in a developing country. Everything under the sun is being privatized, partly because of the influence of this global actor. Most American citizens have no clue who the IMF is. But you go to the rural areas, the most rural outlying areas in Bolivia, and talk to the peasants there. They can tell you who the IMF is, because they're privatizing all kinds of stuff as a condition. And Bolivia, for example, wouldn't have much of a choice. They have to do what the IMF wants because they need the money to stabilize their currency. So the IMF has enormous leverage. One of my colleagues says they really have you over the barrel at that point. All right? And that's what's sort of interesting is that this global organization that had a very simple job of raiding countries and being sort of a coordinator, a very simple, elegant job of being the coordinator of global monetary exchange, suddenly got in the business of loaning money and stipulating conditions for what these countries we're doing. So you see the creep of global organizations as they get bigger and bigger and more and more influential in the global economy. In 2008, the IMF loaned over $16 billion. So they have enormous influence in the global economy, and they've started to push a lot of reforms in these developing countries, many of which, some of which are good, some of which many of these developing countries are not happy about. Also, you can mention the World Bank, which had the goal, also was built in Bretton Woods in this post-World War II conference where they tried to establish the global inf infrastructure. And it's also based in D.C. Its goal is poverty reduction, growth and development, and reconstruction. Um, and, but it's also gotten in the business of doing research. So a lot of the ideas, a lot of the scholarship that's being done on the global economy, some of the readings that I had you, uh, that I provided for today by Wade and Revolian, those are by scholars that are at the World Bank. So they became sort of the, the global think tank of the global economy. And they're also very involved in debt relief as well. And they also, in the 1980s especially, had a lot of this influence on developing countries like the IMF did. Two other big ones we can talk about. One is the World Trade Organization, which is very famous. We had a big conference in the late 1990s in Seattle with the WTO, and there was a lot of protest. It tends to be sort of a lightning rod for the global economy. And the World Trade Organization actually has been around pretty much since World War II. It was originally called the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, and its job is basically just to kind of be the, the sort of the judiciary, if you will, 
for the global trading arrangements. And their job is to you know, coordinate free trade, encourage free trade and fair competition, resolve disputes between countries. So when George W. Bush put uh, tariffs on steel that were coming to the United States as a way to protect the U.S. steel industry, he did this in early, I think it was 2002, this really was something the WTO said, no, you can't do this. So he did it. It was politically favorable. He helped the steel industry briefly, maybe in the United States. But in the long run, the WTO stepped in and said, look, you signed our agreements. You signed all of our treaties. You're not allowed to do this. And so they had to get rid of this. So the WTO has become quite important because it adjudicates all of the conflicts between countries on trade agreements. All right. So if we want to put some sort of subsidy, subsidy in our one of our industries, we have to be sure it's consistent with our trade agreements around the world. And the WTO is sort of the one that oversees all of this. So the WTO has become very famous because it's the one that's adjudicating these trade agreements. But it really isn't responsible for anything because these countries countries agreed to these trade agreements on their own. The European Union, in my mind, is the most important global actor in many ways. It's only a few short years from now, the European Union is going to be the world's biggest economy. If we think of it as one economy, it's going to be bigger than the United States, and it's going to be bigger than China. It'll take a little time, but if they keep going like they're going, doing the things they're doing, I actually have a lot of faith in the European Union, and the United States is going to be sort of second fiddle, because the European Union is an amazing construction. I mean, just think about this. Early in the 20th century, we had two world wars in Europe, all right? Germany and France, these people hated each other, right? The Dutch, they're still pissed at Germany, right? But what they did after World War II is they started to get together and find a way to build a common market. And this common market originally was built on things like allowing German steel and coal and French uh, steel and coal to be exchanged effectively. It built into a gigantic super state. And this is an amazing accomplishment. They've really built an economy, built a government from the ground up that unites these European economies. And you would note, we haven't had a world war since World War II. I think the European Union gets some of the credit for that occurring. All right. Moreover, the European Union has incredibly catalyzed and encouraged a lot of trade, a lot of migration, a lot of flows of people and information across these borders within Europe. And so even though people still speak their own languages, there's still a lot of regional identity within Europe, it's an amazing sort of unification that's occurring, quite impressive within global history. And the European Union has the job of managing the EU, but they've grown into this massive bureaucracy. So if you go to Brussels, you can see buildings like the European Commission, where the flags of all the member states are there, and they now run the European you know, monetary union, which has its own currency, which if you've traveled in Europe, as many of you may have, you know, it's really made it a lot easier. You don't have to exchange dollar or whatever currency at each national border. And so it's quite interesting. I mean, this is really an amazing social experiment when we think historically about a bunch of key people coming together, a bunch of countries with historically conflicting interests and saying, let's form a confederation. And not only that, we're going to have the same currency. So it's really an tr tr amazing transformation that really is, I think, in some ways, a model for how the global economy is unfolding. All right, so let's talk about this concretely. Um, I talked about there was an earlier wave of globalization, and as you can see, this is from 1830 to 1992, and I'll go ahead and say these numbers are estimates. We don't really know what trade levels were around 1880, but we have information that gives us a good estimate of what it looked like. And you do see that earlier wave. Around the beginning of the 20th century, 1900, there was this sort of wave where we had a rise in exports and imports. Trade as a percent of the global economy. The amount of goods and services exchanged as a percentage of the total amount of economic activity. Okay? And it really did occur. So in the you know, middle of the 20th century, you might have said, well, we've seen a global economy before. In the 1980s, many scholars said, oh, this globalization stuff, it's not that new. We've seen global exchange before. Early 20th century, there was high levels. All we've really done is restore the levels that existed prior to the First World Wars. And up until this goes to 1990, it was basically just cycling back upwards after the period. What really drove it down was the Great Depression and World Wars that really sort of cut, undercut the global economy. But what we now know, if you look just at the figures since 1960, the numbers are different from the previous slide because different ways to estimate things, but it gives you the picture of right is that since the 1960s, and you look all the way to 2007, it's really just kept going. Okay, So early 1990s, early 1980s, tons of scholars were writing books, and they were arguing, is globalization real? Is it really something new? Is the level of trade we're seeing something distinctive, or have we seen it before? And many people said, it's not that new. It's not that big a deal. Now, that's a harder argument to make. Because nowadays, it kept going. It was sort of like we thought we were seeing a peak around 1990, but if you look sort of in the middle of the figure in 1990s, over the course of the 90s, it blew up again. 
Okay, so trade has just kept going. And I haven't yet seen it plateau. It may be plateauing with the global economic recession we're experiencing right now, but it's historically unprecedented levels of trade. It really is unique. Okay, and we're looking at something like 50 to 60% of the global economy is involved in trade somehow. Um, on the bottom, you see foreign direct investment, which, as I said, is one of the ways that international investment can occur as different from portfolio investment. It's much smaller, but it's certainly grown as well. Uh, we can look specifically at the affluent democracies, which are the 18 or so rich democracies, Japan, Western Europe, North America. You can imagine the countries. And we see some interesting trends. The United States is the dotted line on the bottom. And you could say, well, the U.S. seems pretty small. But over the course of 75, 1975, 2004, the U.S. doubled. It went from like 15 to 20 percent in terms of trade and investment as a percent of our economy, upwards to 30 to 40 percent of ter trades as a per and investment as a per percentage of our economy. The one country that's actually the global laggard in terms of trade amongst the affluent democracies is one I wouldn't have guessed. It's actually Japan. Japan remains a relatively inwardly looking economy compared to many of the other affluent democracies. And the West Europeans, they're setting the, 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 they're setting the pace. You know, they're off the charts. And so you have a dramatic growth. Many of these countries are trading more, so more than 100% of their economy, if you value the exports and imports as a ratio of the percent of their economy. Some of these West European countries are just so heavily involved in international financial flows. They trade everything. They invest in everything across borders. Much of that is within Europe, so it's regional, but it's still quite global. And these West European economies are really just blowing up in terms of globalization over the past 30 years. Okay, other things we can look at. We can look at some of the regions of the world. Here I show you in the red, 1970, 2006, in the blue, just to get the picture of this. Of course, the numbers aren't as specifically important, uh, but I'll give you a couple figures to note. In 1970, East Asia and the Pacific, which includes China, Taiwan, South Korea, so forth, only about 15 to 16 percent of their economy was engaged in trade. Now it's over 87 percent. Okay, so it's a, I mean, this is truly an enormous transformation. I mean, China in 1970 was comparable to sub-Saharan Africa in terms of poverty, economic well-being, so forth. Nowadays, partly because of trade, there's been this massive exp ex expansion in trade. So one region that's really in trouble right now economically is China and East Asia because they depend so much on exports as a percent of their economy when the countries that are importing, like the United States, go downhill and aren't buying as many of their products, what's going to happen to all these firms that are producing the blue jeans in Taiwan and China? They're in deep trouble. So there's massive layoffs, there's unemployment that's occurring in China. And so even though their economy is qu doing quite well compared to other parts of the world, they're really feeling the pinch. They're really feeling the pinch. Other regions we can point to. South Asia is truly another global success story. In 1970, only about 12% of their economy was based in trade. Now now it's almost half. Okay, so it's a massive change. All right, we can also look at the euro area, which saw a big expansion as well. About half of their economy was in trade in 1970, and now it's over almost 80%. Okay, so most of Europeans are involved in some sort of international exchange. The United States is smaller than many of these other regions, partly because we have a big economy. So when I say trade over GDP, the GDP is a big denominator. But still, it went from about 11% in 1970 to almost 30% by 2006. So a real big improvement or increase in the amount of globalization. Other ways we can look at this. We can look at immigration. So this is a percent of the population in each of these regions that's foreign born. They were born in another country, and then, now they live in another country. Um, there are, we don't have data on Eastern Europe in 1970, but that's a big chair. Over 6% of their population is foreign born. But really, it's the European countries and the United States that are now the home to the world's migrants, and the United States is some Something like 13% of our population is foreign born, whereas it was less than 6% in 1970. Europe has also seen a massive expansion. Almost 10% is foreign born, whereas only 4% was foreign born in 1970. So a big, big growth in migration. You also see a decline in terms of percent foreign born in such places as South Asia, Sub Saharan Africa, Latin America. They actually have less immigrants in their countries than they had in 1970 as a share of their population. I also like to look at the flows. That was the percentage, what we often call the stock of immigrants. The flows are even more striking. If you look at the net migration, sort of positive or negative, how many people are coming or going? All right, and it really blows your mind. Um, you know, not only does the United States have something like 6.5 million people coming to the United States every year, but and that's up from what it was in 1970 when it was still already 2.4 million. 
But you can look at places like Europe. Europe is really experiencing an amazing transformation in terms of immigration. How they handle that is really going to be, it's kind of an open question. It's going to be a real interesting social process to see this unfold. But Europe, in 1970, was a net exporter of people. Overall, they had net flows of population. More people were leaving Europe than coming. And now Europe actually has 6.9 million people coming into that region. So they're getting more people than the United States is, not as a percent of their population, but overall in flows. All right? And that's turning things not just from a lower level, but from a previously they were never an immigrant destination. It's only really recently that tons of migrants are coming into Europe. And this is quite new, that Europe is the new immigrant destination, even more so than the United States. Um, we also see some of the changes occurring around the world. Latin America has often been a sender of people. We know this, not surprising. But the level at which it's sending people has really grown, partly because those economies really struggled in the 1980s and 1990s. If you're a young person growing up in Argentina, you're thinking to yourself, there aren't many jobs. I need to go somewhere to get a better employment opportunity. So there's been a lot of push factors pushing people out of Latin America. But you also see the growth of migration from East Asia, from the Middle East to North Africa, and from South Asia. I should say the Middle East includes North Africa as well. Okay, so I've given you a picture of how, what's new about the global economy, how it's changed, how it's grown, so forth. Let's also talk about what this means for inequalities, one of the topics that I do research upon. And I gave you two readings. I know they're a little bit technical. Hopefully, the presentation here will make them a little less technical. But you can look to the Revolian and the Wade readings as giving you a little bit more depth, maybe to supplement what you hear today. If you want to see some of the fine-grained numbers, those are good resources for learning more about these specifics. Okay, let's just give you a first a big picture. Okay, the world is incredibly unequal. That's not an earth-shattering statement. But when you look concretely at the numbers, it's really Really rather mind-blowing. Okay? The richest 1% of people in the world, the richest 1% of people earns more than the bottom 60% of the world's population. Okay? So the 1% is richer than the bottom 60%. The richest 25% gets more than 75% of the world's income, while the bottom 75% gets less than 25%. So it's almost completely inverted. The top 20% 20, 20 of the world's population owns about 86% of the wealth. Okay, so it's an amazingly skewed distribution of income. We look at our cities today in the United States. We've really seen an explosion of inequality compared to, say, what it was in the 1970s even. Okay? But when you look at the global economy, our inequality is trivial compared to the massive inequalities between rich people in rich countries and poor people in poor countries. It's really mind-blowing. Okay, give you one sort of fun fact on these ways to know this. Uh, Bill Gates renovated his, his house a few years ago and built this fancy, spectacular house in Seattle. And each of the tiles, each of the single tiles in Bill Gates' kitchen cost over $800. And that's double the average income of Africa's poorest countries. Okay, so each of those tiles is worth more than two people in dollar value than many of Africa's poorest countries. So it's an amazingly unequal income distribution around the world. Just to put this into sharper relief, let's look at the concrete numbers. The world economy is something like $35 trillion, roughly. You know, those are 35,000 billion. You get the pictures, so the $35 trillion. But what's really striking is if you look at low-income countries, um, their, their economy is only about $1.6 trillion, okay? So it's a tiny share of the world's income, all right? Middle-income countries are something like $12 trillion, and rich countries are something like 20 to $21 trillion in terms of the global economy. So even though high-income countries are a small share of the world's population, maybe a billion people out of, say, 6 billion people, it's incredibly large share of the global economy. So even though we're seeing all these flows, even though there's... You know, flows of people, trade, goods, services, information across borders and across geographic space. The world is still very dominated by a core of rich countries, all right? Um, you can look at this specifically in certain regions. Looking at the United States and Europe over on the right-hand side, the U.S. has an economy somewhere on the order of $12 trillion. Europe is somewhere on the order of $10 trillion. And these figures are, again, in 2005, so they're a little bit dated. And these are in supposedly convertible dollars, so the numbers are the same across countries. If you look at places like Sub-Saharan Africa, they have an economy of about $1.3 trillion. So it's much, much smaller, maybe a tenth of the size of the U.S. economy, even though there's far more people in Sub-Saharan Africa. Okay? You can also look at this in terms of GDP per capita in the blue bars and population in the red lines. Okay? So if you look at the world's population, which, by the way, is indexed on the right-hand side, the right axis, so the billions of people, the world's population is somewhere on the order of six and a half, almost seven billion people, and that's with the red line. 
Low-income countries have something like, you know, one and a half billion people, all right? Rich-income countries have something like one billion people. The middle-income countries, there's two simple explanations for this, India and China, right? So that's half the world's population. That's something on the order of, let's see, it looks like about four billion people, and they're in the middle. If you look at their GDP per capita, which is sort of the dollar amount per person per year, the middle-income countries are roughly about $5,000 per capita, and in, in, that's what each person earns in a given year, okay? The rich countries are about $32,000, $33,000 per capita, and the poor countries are about $1,300 per capita. And many people have looked at this sort of figure and said, you know, the world really doesn't have a middle class. We have a, a small group of people, about a billion people that are rich, we have four billion that we can call middle income, but really they're much closer to the poor. They're at like five thousand dollars per capita, and then we have a whole bunch of people, about a billion, that are very, very poor, less than a thousand dollars per capita, or maybe less than two thousand dollars per capita. So the world doesn't really have a middle class. It has a you know a relatively uh, sizable share of poor people, a sizable share that's a little bit less poor, and a small share of people that's very, very rich by comparison. And that pretty much characterizes the global income distribution. And you can see this with regions like South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. For example, South Asia has about $2,000 per capita. Sub-Saharan Africa, which is below the Saharan Desert, that part of Africa we treat as different than we do North Africa, which we tend to lump with the Middle East. And they're at like $1,700 per capita. The United States is at about $41,000 per capita, $42,000 per capita. You really see the global inequality. This is not new. So this is what I would call the traditional global inequality, that there are rich countries, there are poor countries, there are rich people, and there are poor people. And it's really skewed distribution. That's not new. All right? Um, and you can see this. This is one of the figures. I know this is a mind-boggling graph, but it's from one of the readings. And you can go puzzle through it a little bit. But it's actually a very illuminating figure if you puzzle through it. If we just take one of the slices, one of the lines, one of the percentages of this distribution, we'll look at like what percent of the world's population is at 1% of the income distribution. Well, if you look at the 1% line, they're almost all in Africa. Okay. Most of those people are in Africa. There's a few people that are in EAP, which is East Asia and the Pacific. There's a few people in South Asia at that 1% of the income distribution. So the people that comprise the 1% level, they're mostly in Africa. If you look at the rich end, at the 97th or the 98th percentile of the income distribution, they're all in what we call the OECD, pretty much. They're in the rich democracies, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. Again, that's Western Europe, North America, and Japan, Australia. There's a few in Latin America and the Caribbean, that's the LAC, a few from each of the other world's regions, but you really see the skew of the distribution. Most of the rich is comprised of the OECD, most of the poor is comprised of South Asia, East Asia, and Africa. Okay? And in the middle, there's this middle, right, at 50% of the income distribution, which is almost all East Asia and South Asia. But you really get a portrait of the global income distribution skew. You could look at the, let's look at the red line first, and say I just treated each country in the world as one person, and I didn't weight each of these countries by the size of their population. I just said, let's look at the, the 150 to 200 countries in the world. And has that average for each of those countries gotten more unequal or more equal? If you look at the unweighted average between countries, global inequality has risen. And people say, well, that's kind of deceptive because you're treating China as one unit of analysis and you're treating, you know, I don't know, uh, you know, Malawi as the same unit of analysis, even though China is a much larger country. So you could weight your measure of inequality. These are what we call a Gini coefficient. You could weight that by population. And the blue line says, hey, we're making progress. Globalization has worked. China and India have made so much progress. They really have that the world is becoming a more equal place. So if nobody else moves, if South Asia or South Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa stagnates and the rich stagnate, just because of the fact that China and India are growing so rapidly, the world is becoming more equal. Because this is half the world's population, right? So just mathematically, it works out that way. But maybe the best way to look at global inequality is the green line at the top, and that's to look at within and between countries. Okay? So it says not only is China a big part of the story, but how about the inequalities within China? And China is a massively unequal place. They have places in the eastern part of the country, close to the coast, that are as rich as any city in the United States. I mean, Beijing has incredibly wealthy people, incredibly affluent parts of the country, but the rural areas of China are still incredibly poor. And the story holds with India as well. So if you factor in both inequalities between countries and within countries, and you wait for population, the green line gives us the full picture. 
And globalization has occurred during this period of time, right? So during this period of time, if we use the green line, globalization actually has actually worsened inequalities because it's expanded the inequalities within countries. So there's progress in terms of East Asia and South Asia, but there's also lots of inequality that's getting magnified. Okay, so just to give you some pictures on this, um, and I think I've hit this point pretty well, you could look back further in time. Um, if you looked at, like, say, 1820, prior to the boom that occurred around 1900, um, Western Europe was about three times richer than Africa, but by the 1990s, Western Europe was about 14 times richer than Africa. So there really was a longer-term growth. And what occurred was that prior to the, 19, the 1900s, to the 20th century, the world just didn't have that much money to throw around. There couldn't be much inequality because the world just didn't have that big of an economy. And what happened was the West industrialized. So Western Europe, North America industrialized really, really rapidly. So the world inequality sort of blew up, okay? And it really expanded over the course of the 19th and into the 20th century. And some would say it's plateaued. I think it might actually be getting a little bit worse over the end of the 20th century, okay? All right, let's talk a little bit further about this. Um, in addition to looking at income, I think it's always better to judge the global inequality in terms of well-being, all right? And I think, you know, who cares about the dollars per capita? That matters only because it buys well-being, okay? Economic dollars don't have an intrinsic value. We may feel this way, like it makes you a better person to have more dollars, but what matters is if you have resources to buy well-being. Can you feed your children? Can you live to a long life? Can you buy the health care that you need? So I like to look at well-being. I think well-being is more important than dollars as a way to judge the global economy. And we see lots of progress, but still persistent traditional inequalities. So this is life expectancy. How long do you expect to live if you survive from birth? All right, so not counting the children that don't, don't make it through birth. All right, and what we see is the U.S. and Europe, you know, these are people expect a very, very long life, and that was the case in 1970. It was also the case in 2007. All right, um, and, you know, in the United States and Europe, we expect to live 80 to 78 years. Europe actually is beating the United States in terms of life expectancy. The U.S. has much worse health than Europe does in many ways. Okay, but if you look at other parts of the world, you could say, well, we're really making progress. South Asia in 1970, you didn't expect to live 50 years. Okay, you expected to live 49 years. Now you can expect to live 64 years. I mean, this is real progress. This is incredible. People are living 15 years longer over the course of their lives. So it's really changing the populations of these countries. But there's also failures. All right, if you look at sub-Saharan Africa, is really the biggest crisis our global economy faces, okay? There really hasn't been any progress in 37 years in terms of life expectancy in sub-Saharan Africa. And partly, that's because things got a little bit better from the 1970s to the 1980s, and then they got a lot worse from the 1980s to the present, and the obvious answer is the AIDS crisis, okay? So in sub-Saharan Africa in 1970, you expected to live 45 years. You still only expect to live 51 all right, so it, the world is incredibly unequal when you look at life expectancy. I mean, you're going to live a third longer if you are lucky, if you had the good fortune or maybe the cleverness to be born in the United States. So good for you if you were born in the United States. Good move, you know. If you have the bad luck of being born in sub-Saharan Africa, your life is going to be dramatically shorter, okay. We can also look at the under-5 mortality rate, which I personally think is the best way to measure the global economy. Is this, are these numbers converging? If the global economy is working, these numbers should look more and more alike over time, all right. Look, 1970 to 2007, there's a couple ways to look at this figure. You could say, well, there's tons of progress. We could say, look, you know, all of the red bars are higher than all of the blue bars. So every region of the world has seen their infant mortality decline. And this is the number of live births that live to the age of five out of a thousand, okay? So, or that, excuse me, that, that die before the age of five out of a thousand. So a high number is a bad number, okay? And in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, something like 20% of their children that were born live did not live to the age of five. 20%. I mean, so if you're a mother expecting to have several children, you're going to expect to have a mortality in your life in 1970, okay? And you could say, look at South Asia. I mean, this is spectacular progress. South Asia saw their infant mortality rate or under five mortality rate fall from 210 to 78. I mean, that's true progress, amazing progress. And you really see the success of the global economy. East Asia went from 126 to 27. Okay, this is spectacular progress. And you could say, look, East Asia and South Asia have really bought into the global economy. They really believed in exports and imports and buying into the international exchange. They're success stories. These are the success stories, the arguments for globalization. But you can also look at places like Sub-Saharan Africa. And there's some progress there. They were at 222, and now they're at 146. But that still means about 15% of their babies do not live to the age of five. 
So it's still a massively unequal world. If you look at the rich countries, I mean, we're talking about numbers uh, in 1970, 29 in Europe and 24 in the U.S. Now it's four in Europe and eight in the U.S. that die out of 1,000. So they're incredibly successful in the rich countries, and the disparities between rich and poor are just amazingly large. Yeah, go ahead. Why is the most dramatic... Yeah, it's an amazing story. Okay, so Middle East is one of these great puzzles. I have demography colleagues that study population, fertility, these sorts of things. I'll show you the fertility numbers in just a little bit. It's really, it's really uh, it's interesting. You know, the country that had the fastest drop in its fertility, and fertility feeds into this. So these things are linked. Mothers have fewer kids because they know they're going to live more. You know, so if I know six of my seven children are going to live, I'm not going to have seven kids if I'm a woman, right? I'm going to have three. That's fine, you know? If you have high mortality rates, you're going to have less kids. So the link between fertility and mortality, they go both ways, okay? Um, the country in the world that had the fastest decline in fertility, does anybody have any idea what this is? China was up there. I mean, the one-child policy, incredibly draconian, incredibly violating of human rights, but it was good population policy. I wouldn't, I'm not endorsing it. Don't get me wrong. It's, it's awful. But it worked. I mean, when you tell people, you know, you're going to jail if you have a second kid, people stop having second kids, you know? <laughs> But the country that actually saw their fertility to decline the fastest was Iran. It's an amazing thing. And I, mean, I don't know that much about the Middle East. Maybe some of our, our colleagues that are speaking in the conference here can speak about this. But Iran really saw a big cultural change. So you saw this, despite, I think it's fair to say, the Middle East and North Africa not exactly being utopia for women. Okay? Um, despite that fact, you saw a really important change where there was more use of contraception, health care improved. Some of it is oil dollars. So these regions actually have economically developed um, some of it's the fall of colonialism. So it's, it is a great puzzle, isn't it? I mean, you really saw success in some ways compared to these other parts of the world. And you'd see it also in East Asia. I mean, there really was a dramatic decline as well as well as Latin America. Okay, so I think these are the ways to think of traditional global inequalities, to look at, you know, income, to look at where the world's income is relative to where the world's population is. Like I said, I believe in looking at well-being. I want to know, do these dollars buy improved well-being? I don't care if China, some people in China are getting rich, if people in the rural areas are still dying left and right before they get to the age of five. And I want to judge well-being. So I think that's the best metric in my very biased opinion on how to judge globalization. So what's new? Okay, what is this newly emerging global inequalities I want to talk about? All right. So a couple things we can say. All right. First of all, um, I would characterize the transition we experienced over the past 30 to 40 years as moving from an era of what I would call dependency to an era I would call the new international division of labor. And this is really, again, staying with this timing of the post-1970 era. Okay. Historically, poor countries, you know, there was a pretty clear division of labor. Poor countries were the source of natural resources and agricultural products for the rich countries, okay? The poor countries were, oh, let me back this up. Uh, the rich countries depended, thus the term dependency, on the cheap labor and the cheap products from the poor countries. And the poor countries depended on the commodities for the revenue. So if you were, for example, I studied in Costa Rica when I was in college, and something like two-thirds of their economy at that time was coffee, the other third was bananas. You depended on America consuming coffee and bananas. That was the guts of your economy, right? Now, many viewed this as an exploitative, exploitative or unequal relationship. For example, many, many developing countries got in the business of making coffee over the last 30 years. And sometimes I feel I'm fueling this economy, and I'm personally responsible for the, the growth of the coffee export uh, market, but many of us Americans are. Um, but the, what occurred over the last 30 years was this massive oversupply for coffee, for things like rice, for cocoa, for sugar and tin. And all of these products, basically tons of countries got in the business of selling them. And these products' prices fell through the floor. Okay, so commodity became, coffee used to be a good, solid way to make money for your country. Now it became, the price of coffee just went through the floor. All right? And so this became a very, very difficult thing for developing countries. They often experience what's called the natural resource trap. Okay, so you're selling goods on the global economy. Well, that drives up your currency. And, you know, macroeconomists have to explain how, but what that does is it makes your other products. So say you're selling tons of coffee, or say like Venezuela, you're selling oil. That's going to make your currency more valuable. Then try to say you're trying to develop an auto industry in Venezuela. Well, you can't sell your cars because they're really expensive because oil is driving up the currency. So it messes up your currency. It creates all these volatile boom-bust cycles. So if the economy is good for your, your particular commodity, your economy is booming. But then when the price goes down, your commodity busts. And these unsustainable boom-bust cycles. So it was a really sort of unsustainable, in some ways unequal way for a developing country to try to get rich. It also led to corrupt governments. We see this best of case would be in 
the Middle East and North Africa, but also in Venezuela. Look, when you're getting tons of oil revenue, you don't have to tax anybody. You know, Chavez didn't have to pay anybody, you know, to collect taxes from anyone. And when you don't have to tax anyone, you don't have to answer to anyone. So if you have tons of revenue in your government, Chavez did because of oil revenue, you can just do whatever the hell you want, right? And that's where you get these corrupt governments in the Middle East and North Africa, because they don't need to tax, they don't have to answer to their populace. And so these natural resources, they were a source of revenue, but they're also really a trap. And few countries experience long-term sustainable development because of natural resources. It just never worked. So you sort of were addicted to it in some ways because it was revenue, but it didn't really lead to progress. Now what's occurred in the past 30 years is poor countries have gotten in the business of manufacturing. This is really distinctive to the last 30 years, and this is very, very unique. You didn't see this with the steamship routes. Back then they were doing classical dependency. They were sending products to the rich countries on the boats, and they were getting money back, right? And they were maybe trading for things between these steamship routes. Now, poor countries are in the business of collecting foreign investment, building manufacturing facilities, and exporting those products. Okay, this is the new global economy. And this has created some really massive changes. Now, we certainly have success stories from this. Let me back this up. Uh, the best success stories are, of course, really countries like Taiwan, countries like South Korea. South Korea really stands out as the one country that was poor in 1950 that is now arguably a rich country. It's the one case. So there are success stories. There are arguments for the global economy. There's just not a lot of them. Okay? China has made amazing progress, but it still has a massive ways to go. It's still only like $5,000 per capita. South Korea is the one country that's been a true success story. And it, it's a good question. Can other developing countries emulate the South Korean model? And we all have South Korean products in our homes. I have a Samsung VCR, right? You know, Hyundai's cars apparently have gotten to be better. They had a bad rep, you know, but apparently they're getting to be better cars. And that's the one case. This is the new global economy is these sorts of developing development projects that are focused on manufacturing. Okay, you can see this a couple ways. If you look at exports as a percent of GDP, and this is just within developing countries, so just the bottom two-thirds of the world, you really saw a rise in exports. Percent of manufacturing exports as a share of their exports from 1985 to 2003, a real growth. Um, percent of world's manufacturing exports. Now developing countries are about a third of the world's manufacturing exports, and they st they're getting a big share of the world's foreign investment. So this is really new. And what has this done? Um, it's led to industrialization. So the blue line in the middle, let me concentrate on that. This is a sample of developing countries from a student of mine's uh, dissertation. And he shows, you know, in 1980 to 2003, in just 23 short years, you saw a pretty dramatic growth from around 15% of their labor market. So among, you know, amongst all their people that are employed in these developing countries, about 15% worked in manufacturing. By 2003, it was over 22%, which is actually a number higher than the United States. Okay, so they really saw a growth in blue collar manufacturing jobs, those jobs that we feel like we're losing here in the United States. There's definitely been a growth in developing countries. And this has led to some new inequalities, okay, some really important changes, massive social changes, what I'll call the newly emerging global inequalities that are, on the, that are coming on the scene. Okay. Uh, first of all, this has led to migration to cities of poor countries. Um, so most of the world's population was rural up until 2007. In 2007, one person moved to a city, and for the first time in world history, more people lived in cities than live in rural areas. So this has really changed the population of developing worlds. If you grew up in the developing world 30 years ago, you more than likely you grew up, grew up in a rural area. Your parents might have been farmers. Okay, nowadays you live in, in urban areas. Okay, so this is really a big change. It also, of course, has led to migration to rich countries. We all see this all over the world. Massive infusion of people from other parts of the world to rich countries. And this has also coincided with dramatic advances in technology, in communication, transportation, and travel. Um, you know, I, I, I don't have data on this, but I'm pretty confident that international marriages to American citizens has really grown. Um, my wife is from Spain. You know, I met her when she was a grad student here in the United States. I met her in a bar. I wish I had a better story, but the bottom line is, you know, we've got a kid that's going to be bilingual. His grandparents don't speak a word of English. I don't know what the hell they're talking about most of the time, okay? And, you know, that sort of thing is really unique to this last 30 years in the global economy. It's a really massive transformation. Okay, so as you can tell, I'm, I'm a big proponent of globalization. I'm out there recruiting, you know, in some ways. Yeah. And also, it's led to rapid and uneven urbanization. So not only is everyone flooding to the cities, they're flooding to the rich countries, but they're flooding to the, city, the cities in the rich countries. And not only that, it's led to sort of this lumpy distribution. Cities have these massive populations of rich people. You see a good discussion of this in the Goldman and Longhofer reading that I provided for you. It's a really interesting discussion. But you see massive changes to cities. So if we look at the urbanization rate, what percent of your population lives in cities? 
And the threshold's quite low. It's only a city of 10,000 people. That's urban by the, the international standards. You know, rich countries, US, Europe, we've always been really urbanized, right? What's changed is places like South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, they're still majority rural, but they're really catching up. They're moving fast to catch up. Latin America, the Middle East, North Africa, they've really tipped. They used to be rural, now they're predominantly urban, okay? I'll give you a couple figures of this. This is a slum in, uh, outside of Mumbai, India. It's called Jaravi. And this gives you a pretty good picture of what we're seeing throughout the developing world. You're seeing big, rich cities that are really booming. They're involved in the global economy. They do technology. They have ma massive foreign investment from rich countries. And right alongside, you have a massive population, millions of people living in substandard housing. These, these, these houses are built out of you know, clay, uh, whatever products you can get, metal roofs that you might from a, from, find from a garbage dump. And this is the global economy these days, is massive cities that are growing dramatically with incredibly uneven distributions, okay? So it's really pushing everything to the city. Good example, this is a landfill in New Delhi, India, all right? And as you can see, people basically exist living off of the refuse from these landfills in New Delhi, India. I'll give you another example of this. Uh, I did some work in Peru last year, and I think this is kind of an interesting way to think of global cities. It really was pretty eye-opening for myself. This is Miraflores, which is an incredibly posh, rich suburb. It's difficult to find a hotel in this neighborhood for under $200 a night, all right? Um, and you have this here, this beautiful apartment complexes. There's the ocean. There's a whole group of people that do this sort of uh, wind sailing, what do you call it, wind surfing with a parachute and a boat takes you around. There's a massive tennis and sport facility complex. Just about a mile away, you have incredibly poor shanty towns, okay? And really, the entire city of Lima is surrounded by a ring of these sort of, you know, you can see the, the construction materials that make up this house. You know, it's, it's, it's garbage materials, it's metal roofs they might find, some clay, maybe a few cinder blocks, and huge chunks of the population. All those people who used to live in rural areas in the 70s, they flooded the cities, and they basically created a ring of shanty towns around the city. And they provide the services to the rich people in these cities, okay? So it's a codependent relationship, okay? Some would say it's progress, you know, you know, Paul Krugman has written that, you know, the worst job in these poor countries is better than no job at all. So maybe it's progress, maybe not. It's hard to say. But it's certainly a new type of global inequality. And what this has led to is one thing, is that this is a typical residential neighborhood somewhere in between Miraflores and one of these shanty towns, and every block has an armed guard on the corner. Okay, so the block basically gets together. Like, we have neighborhood associations in North Carolina where I live, and, you know, we, we basically monitor the chlorine content of our swimming pool. Well, their neighborhood association hires an armed guard, okay? And the guy's riding a motorcycle. I think he drove up to kind of see what the heck I was doing with my tourist-looking photo and everything like that. But he's got a little guard booth there. In many neighborhoods in Lima, Peru, middle class, what we, they would consider middle class neighborhoods, are going to have an armed guard right there. And this is a product of the new globalization because people have to flood to cities because that's where the jobs are. But you have these massive inequalities. If I'm growing up in this shanty town, I'm going to knock off a few Volkswagens a year to pay my bills. I'm sorry, but I probably would, you know? It's not shocking to me to see crime spike upwards in these developing countries with this sort of inequality. Okay. Other things we can say. Um, with the massive flows of people, goods and services across borders. I'm sorry. Go ahead before I go on. Please. Want to back up? What? Who's growing the food? Good question. Uh, massive biotechnology corporations, probably. I don't know. That's a great question. That's probably a good answer to why we had a global food crisis over the past few years. Commodities are cheaper. Um, you know, so arguably it's bigger companies, fewer people working in those rural areas, right? Um, so you have large landowners that have corporations basically uh, growing the food. That's a great way to, that's a great question. Um, you know, so where's the world, where's the United States getting its food from? A lot from Latin America, sure, but it's not peasants with small family farms. I can tell you that. That's what it doesn't look like. Yeah, please. It is larger in countries in between. Okay, so if you're a very poor country, uh, you know, a Malawi, inequality is not nearly as bad as it is in South Africa, which is arguably a much richer country than Malawi. And so it's the countries in between. Typically, inequality within a country spikes as a country develops. So early 20th century United States, when we were peaking with our industrialization and you have millions of migrants coming here, that was sort of our peak inequality. It declined over the 20th century. Many of these countries are going through that transition right now. So they're going from poor peasant societies where inequality is low because nobody has any money to suddenly a few people have tons of money and most are peasants. Okay? And this is often called the Kuznets curve, named after a famous economist that theorized this. Okay? So a lot of countries are experiencing the Kuznets curve. You could say that's good news because in 30, 50 years, maybe Peru will look something like South Korea. 
I don't know. I'm not quite that optimistic. It's hard to say. Okay? Another consequence of globalization, massive flows of people across borders, across countries, is diseases. Okay? So we know this, a good example of global inequality. Um, Africa now has about 5% of its adult population is infected with HIV. No other country is even at 1% of its adult population. No other region, excuse me. Okay? And this is a recent thing. Right? We didn't have HIV in 1970. All right? And so this is, I mean, we've never quite seen anything like what South Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa is going through. And that's where, throughout history, developing countries, their life expectancy every year would get a little bit better. You know, it sort of was a progress of development. And over the decades, your life expectancy would get longer. Over the past 20 or so years, Sub-Saharan Africa's life expectancy has gone backwards in a massive way. All right? And AIDS is the story. Okay, so this is one of the problems of the global economy is it can be linked to AIDS in many ways. Okay, um, okay other things we can say. So what are we going to do? This is a very grim, discouraging talk. I just gave you the statistics on HIV AIDS. I'd say there's some ways we can see progress. Okay, and let me point to a few ways in which we potentially will see some progress and potentially can hope to narrow some of the newly emerging global inequalities as well as to address some of these long-standing traditional global inequalities. Okay. Talk about a few. First of all, economic growth. If we can get these economies to grow, that's part of the solution. Um, some would say it's the biggest, the, the most important factor, okay? I don't know. I think it's part of the story. I think most developing countries that are growing economically are seeing some progress. The problem is a lot of them are not growing, okay? So let's talk a little bit about this. Um, if you want to think about the world, you can think about it as composed of basically a rich billion people, Okay, a middle class, although I don't really think it's middle class, a, a, less, a, a, a moderately poor 4 billion people and a very poor backsliding billion people. Paul Collier has sort of a bestseller book. He's a sort of popular economist. It's called The Bottom Billion. You can buy it in any Borders or Barnes & Noble, although I should get some money for mentioning that. Shouldn't it Barnes & Noble? You know, I want some endorsement. Um, so he's written this book. It's called The Bottom Billion. And his story is that, like, look, you know, the rich – Billion is doing fine. U.S. isn't really in trouble in terms of high infant mortality or plummeting GDP per capita. The middle four billion, well, they're, they're doing better. You know, India and China basically makes up that story, and they're doing a lot better than they were 30 years ago. If everybody was growing like the middle four billion, the world wouldn't have as many problems. And he shows this. He said, look, the middle four billion grew about 2.5% a year economically, which is a pretty solid economic growth over the 1970s. In the 1980s, they grew 4% a year. So that middle $4 billion was really improving. They really saw some progress. And since 2000, they're growing 4.5% a year. The United States grows 2 to 3% a year. So places like India and China are growing 10 15% a year. They're really seeing progress. And we can say, look, the global economy is working. That middle $4 billion is progressing. Well, the problem is the bottom billion is going backwards. Okay, so in the 1970s, they only grew half half a percent a year. So it's, you know, economically growth is what I mean, not population growth. But economically, they only grew about half percent a year. In the 1980s, they declined by about 0.4 percent per year. In the 1990s, they declined by half a percent per year. So in 1970, the bottom billion was richer than it was in 2000. Okay, so just think about that. A billion people in the world is worse off in 2000 than it was in 1970. And this is really the dilemma. How do we get that bottom billion of the world's economy to grow even if it was half as good as what they're doing in India and China, okay? And that's the great puzzle of development that we really face in our global economy today is how do you make sub-Saharan Africa experience the success that South Korea saw, okay? And that's the real, real challenge we face. All right, uh, Paul Collier, who wrote this book, The Bottom Billion, has a good line. He says, you know, growth is not a cure-all. Just because your economy growing, it's not going to fix everything. He says, growth is not a cure-all, but the lack of growth is a kill-all. All right, so the absolute lack of economic growth is really devastating sub-Saharan Africa. And you want to explain. People wonder why there's so many millions. I mean, what is it? 6.9 million people are migrating into Europe every year. If I'm growing up in sub-Saharan Africa, I'm getting on a boat and getting the hell out of there, you know? Who can blame anyone when there's no jobs, there's no economic opportunities, your children are still facing high mortality rates, schooling opportunities are very limited. If nothing else, I move into the city. Right? So the economic engines are really pulling you, and there's a push from a lack of opportunity in these rural areas. It's really, really striking. Okay, so growth is part of the solution, but it's certainly not all. Often I would say most of the discussion in the World Bank or these global international community, intellectual communities, it focuses only on economic growth. I'm here to say that's part of the story. I'm not denying the value of economic growth, but it's certainly not going to fix everything. So I'm going to point to a few other ways that I think we can really see progress, one of which is what I would call the world polity. And you read an article by John Meyer. 
And he's a really interesting theorist. I really encourage you to read this article. He talks about the globe as Babbitt. And apparently it's about how, why is it countries all over the world conform? You know, and he tells these stories of going to a school in sub-Saharan Africa, talking to an education minister, and they're visiting a classroom, and the teacher doesn't have chalk, they don't have any books in the classroom, the teacher doesn't really understand the material she's teaching, the kids are just doing rote memorization, and this minister from the government says, we need to get engineers to compete in the global economy. And, you know, Meyer's like, what, what the hell are you talking about? And what he's saying is that there's this world polity, there's this canopy, of international governmental organizations and non-governmental organizations that sets the scripts, the discourse, the, the culture of our global economy. And in many ways, there's all this talk of democracy, there's all this talk of education, all this talk of freedom, but the on-the-ground realities are often detached from that, right? I mean, you know, in rural sub-Saharan Africa, they don't need engineers as much as they need secondary schooling, okay? And his argument is that we need to get these international government organizations to match their rhetoric with the reality a little bit better. And if we do so, we can see some real progress in improving world well-being. So the United Nations, the United States, is role as a contributor to many organizations, we can fuel some positive social change in developing countries if we can get this canopy, if you want to think of it, it's sort of this, this canopy that floats above the global economy where all the talk of globalization, people like me, do spend all our time talking about globalization, this is where we can see some success, the NGOs and the INGOs. Um, and organizations like the United Nations, the Amnesty International, they can do some real good. And I'll show you some evidence of that in just a moment. Um, and we can talk of these as sort of a global civil society as well as the super states, the EU. So to me, the biggest responsibility in the world really falls on the EU. They're going to be the biggest economy in the world. They're going to be a massive player in terms of consumption of products from developing countries. They're getting a ton of immigrants. It's a multi-ethnic, multicultural society. They have to find ways to cooperate within Europe. They also have to find ways to fuel development within the, in the poor countries. And so the EU is going to be very interesting. Hopefully they rise to the challenge. Okay? In some ways they're doing better than us, in some ways not. Okay? If you want to look at this, um, this graph shows you from 1820 to 2000 the number of intergovernmental organizations, which is IGOs, things like the United Nations, and the number of states, the number of governments, just states. Okay? And both have grown. There's been a lot more governments in the world, right? There's a lot more countries in the world, but the number of IGOs has even grown more rapidly. Okay? And so there's this sort of phenomenal growth in global civil society and global organizations, and perhaps that could be an engine for progress. Let me give you some ways to think about this. Um, what? I don't have the NGOs. The story is the same. Uh, yeah, the story is the same. I don't have a good figure. I'll admit I stole this figure from a friend and colleague, um, and he just had a nice figure, I think, to show social, social change. The, I, the INGOs, international non-government organizations, the story is the same, and that you see this massive growth. Okay? And Europe is actually leading the world in NGOs. They're, they love to be members of environmental organizations, volunteer organizations, so forth. Okay? Now, one of the ways this has worked, I would say the global canopy of civil society has really worked, is to cultivate the message that every kid should go to secondary school. Okay? And to me, I, I would put my dollar on the line and say, if I were to bet on one thing to make progress in sub-Saharan Africa, as well as the poor regions of the world, it would be secondary schooling. Primary schooling is important, but we do, primary schooling is pretty well advanced around the world compared to secondary schooling. Secondary schooling is really where the system breaks down. Okay? So hopefully, as secondary school teachers, in some cases, this is good news for you. You feel, um, I hope you can see that this is really making a lot of progress in the world. And secondary schooling, um, you know, this is absolutely crucial. Um, I'll show you another figure that's related to this. But when we talk about low secondary schooling, if a country doesn't have a lot of secondary schooling, say it's at, like, let's look at sub-Saharan Africa, which in 1991, now the red here is much more recent because that's the most recent data I could get, only about 20% of kids were in school in the enrollment rates in sub-Saharan Africa. And now it's a little over 30%, so there's some progress. But the kids that are pretty much not in schools are mostly girls. Okay, so that's what we're talking about. So you want to know what's going on in South Asia, where slightly less than half of the, the kids are not in school. It's mostly girls. Okay? So when we talk about boosting secondary school enrollment, we're talking about schooling girls. And that's really, in my opinion, one of the most powerful things we can do to improve the global well-being of the world's poor. Okay? Um, and I would say, I would even, if I were to be here with Paul Collier, I would bet with him. I'd rather invest in schools. He can invest in economic growth as the first and biggest priority. I'd put my money on schools. I think they're going to make a bigger difference if, they, if it happens. And we've seen this. The places that are really growing, if you look at, there's progress in South Asia, right? They're much better off than they were even 15 years ago. 
16 years ago. Um, the Middle East, you know, is now almost 70% of school enrollment rates. Um, Latin America went from 50% to almost 90%. You're really seeing progress that follows this growth in secondary school enrollment. But again, like we see, sub-Saharan Africa is still way behind. They should invest in schools is arguably better than investing in factories. Sorry, go ahead. So is, is that all connected to the relationship with the what? Yeah. Well, it, it, it is when, uh, so it, go, it cuts both ways, right? Okay, so some international, that's a great question, international government organizations have done a bad job in putting gr schools as the priority. I would not say the World Bank and the IMF have put schools as a priority over economic growth. They, I, don't, I don't believe that. They've said, you know, reduce your trade barriers because that will help you grow. Look at South Korea. I say, yeah, look at South Korea. They invested in schools. And so I, I wish some of these IGOs would make schools a bigger priority than economic growth because I think schools will fuel the economic growth. Secondly, there are, on the flip side, some international organizations like the World Bank recently, like the United Nations, that are definitely emphasizing schooling. And so you have, it's, it's, it's working both ways. And so, yeah, if I were to, to push the issue, I would say we need to stop these IGOs that are forcing schools to cut, countries to cut back on their schooling by cutting their budgets, and we need to encourage those IGOs that are encouraging schooling. So it cuts both ways. Please. I, I thought that the, the NGOs, specifically the whole uh, microfinancing, the micro phenomenon, yeah. helping to contribute to higher uh, enrollment rates for yeah. education. Yeah. I, I think yes. I think both, I would say both INGOs, some positive, product, you know, some IGOs have done a great job on this. Some have been, done a very poor job. Um, some INGOs, I would say, yeah, you're right. INGOs probably are more influential than IGOs in encouraging schooling. I think that's a fair argument. Okay? The argument that John Meyer makes is it's this, this civil society composed of IGOs and INGOs that's carrying the message to expand schools. Okay? And I think, yeah, I mean, I, I hope that's not a, a too middle-of-the-road answer. I'd say, yeah, INGOs, they've done a good job on this. IGOs, some have done a very good job, some have done a very poor job. And so to draw, let me explain that uh, World Bank IMF example a little better. So what happens is the IMF says, we'll loan you some money to help you stabilize your currency, but we want you to cut your government budget because your government is too big. What do you do? You cut back schooling. You institute fees so that families that want to send their daughters to school have to pay a fee. Okay, you take away the money for the teachers, so teachers don't show up in the schools because they're not getting paid. Okay, you take away the money for the food that gives these kids a decent meal at school. So a March has sent a famous development economist that said, you know, what we should be doing is providing like a free meal at every developing country school in the world. Kids would come. Okay, in some developing countries, they're being very savvy in providing financial incentives to the mothers to get their kids to go to school. So Mexico has done a pretty good job with this. So the problem is there has been organizations like the IMF and, frankly, the United States Treasury Department through the IMF that have been really eroding the financial base to pay for schools in developing countries. On the flip side, I'll defend, I'll say that the United Nations has done a great job in terms of pushing schooling. So it's a mixed bag in terms of IGOs. But you're right, I think INGOs have done a better job, and they've been a bigger leader in this regard. Not, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it doesn't look good. Yeah, believe me, I know. I mean, North Carolina doesn't pay teachers. Uh, this is a popular argument to make in this crowd, but they don't pay teachers enough. You know, I mean, it's, uh, you know, North Carolina is one of the few states in America that does, doesn't have unionized teachers, and it shows. You know, they're really in deep tr uh, They're getting squeezed. And in developing countries, I'd say it's worse. You know, it's much worse. Please. Yeah. Right, absolutely, and that's a part of the United Nations, right? So it's one of the branches of the United Nations. I'd say, you know, the United Nations has been one of the leaders in taking this message. Whether they're backing it up with dollars, well, that's a little bit harder to say, okay? Um, now, I mentioned earlier, so this is an important cultural change. Again, if I were to bet my money on any one thing we could do, it would be build schools for girls in developing countries. That would be my number one priority, even more than investing in technology or sort of trying to become South Korea by trying to have manufacture and export. Schools would be my number one priority. And I'll admit, I'm a partisan on this issue. This is my, my, I bet my money on this. Related to this, very tightly related to this, is fertility rates. And like I said, these two things go together. If you school girls, you bring, keep them in school in secondary school, they delay childbirth and they have fewer kids. Okay, so if you're 15 and you're a girl, 
or a young woman in sub-Saharan Africa, you're not as, and you're in school, you're less likely to have a child, right? So fertility rates and schooling go together. Now, it's hard to say. It's really sort of a thorny question to say which causes which. I think they both cause each other, right? So if you delay fertility, people can stay in school. If they stay in school, they delay fertility. Now, both of these boost well-being like you wouldn't believe, okay? So if you want to reduce infant mortality, reduce fertility. Okay, these things go together, all right? So we have seen some amazing progress. And again, somebody mentioned Middle East and North Africa. They really are the success story in terms of reducing fertility rates. Um, I think, you know, we can see more happening in the future in sub-Saharan Africa. I mean, if we can get fertility rates, look, they used to be at six and a half. Now they might, they're below five. I mean, that's real progress. So if we can get fertility rates down and we can keep especially girls, not I, by no means am I opposed to boy schooling, but I think the biggest dent in the problem could be made within girl schooling, you know, that's where we can really make some progress. Please, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you're right. What happens if your fertility rate declines and all of your young people have moved to Spain? You know, I mean, if you're in sub-Saharan Africa, you're right. There are demographic challenges. I would just say the demographic challenges of having a young dependent population right now are the bigger problem. So there's what's called the demographic transition. And by the way, I'm now in, officially in q and I'm done with all my slides. So this is a good, good launching point. All right, so the demographic transition occurs, and it occurred in the United States in the 19th century. What happens is somewhere along the way, mortality starts to fall, so deaths start to decline. Okay, is it improved medicine? One of the big things is improved water supply. So you want to make progress in sub-Saharan Africa? Build improved water sources so people don't have to use rivers that they're cleaning their clothes in and where there might be parasites. That's where malaria is one of the world's biggest killers. So water sources can be a big one. Anyway, at some point in development, mortality starts to decline. Usually right around that time, fertility declines as well, okay? Because partly mothers and fathers start to realize, look, we don't need to have six kids to protect our Social Security in old age. We can have three because they're mostly going to live to adulthood, all right? And so there's this sort of early decline of mortality and then subsequent decline of fertility. During that period, population explodes because mortality is dropping faster than fertility. And there's a little bit of a lag before fertility starts to decline as well. Okay? And that's where you see a population boom. So the bigger problem in developing countries right now is they're experiencing a population boom. Mortality is starting to improve. Fertility is not yet caught up. And so people aren't dying as much as they used to, but you're still having six or seven kids. All right? So you get this little boom of population, and that's why you see in most developing countries something like two-thirds of their population is under 15. You know, and that's the dependent population they really need to worry about. Now, it's true. Somewhere down the line, you're going to have this elder population you have to take care of, but we're not there yet. I think that's so much further down the horizon, um, partly because of, you know, fertility rates still being high, partly because HIV AIDS is killing a lot of middle, middle-aged people, you know, or people in their, their young adulthood. And so we're not there yet. It's not a problem yet. Um, yeah, I think it could be a problem in the future, but... Um, we're a long ways away. You can also point to, I mean, we're seeing that your question is sort of unfolding in Western Europe right now. So in Western Europe, I'll just give you these numbers on fertility rates. In uh, 1970, the fertility rates were 2.4. So every woman was having 2.4 children over their lifespan. Now it's 1.5. Okay? And the argument is that you need usually 2.1 as the fertility rate you need to maintain your population. So Western Europe is experiencing negative population growth. What's saving them is immigration. Okay, so Western Europe is having a lot of cultural conflict over immigration. It's going to be very puzzling, interesting to see how they resolve this, but they need those immigrants because they're a rapidly aging society and they're not having that many kids. Okay? Now, the United States maintains fertility rates about 2.1. Okay, so we're, we're more fertile than Western Europe is, but those are the countries where aging is a bigger problem than child mortality. The rest of the world, I think we're not quite there yet. I mean, maybe Eastern Europe will be there because fertility, I mean, state socialism was pretty good health care. I mean, it wasn't great. I, would, I, would, I don't want to live in a state socialist society. But, you know, I mean, Poland had lower mortality than, uh, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of an example of uh, Afghanistan. So, I mean, the, those state socialist societies had relatively low fertility, okay, and mortality is relatively low. They're also aging quite rapidly as well. Does that answer your question? Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Right. So two things. I'll, it's good I stopped on this one. So it's migration cross country. 
Okay, the one I was talking about migration. This is migration within country. Okay, the story of global migration within country is the story of urbanization. Right. So in Peru, for example, I showed you that figure. I mean. Hundreds of thousands of people have moved from rural areas to the big cities of Peru. That's the migration story that's occurring over the past 30 years within countries. When I talk of migrants, I'm talking cross-national. Okay? So people that were born in a different country moving to a new country. Okay, so net migration. This is raw numbers of people. These are between countries. Okay? So in the United States, we're getting 6.5 million people every year from another country. Okay? Europe is getting 6.9 million people from another country. And like I said, let's take Latin America as an example of that. I've got the numbers on this specifically. Latin America is sending out uh, 6.8 million people. Okay? So there are some people coming into those countries. Certainly there's inward migration in almost any country in the world. But 6.8 million are leaving more than are coming in. So it's a net. The net loss of population is 6.8 million. Okay? Does that answer your question? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Should we wrap it up? Okay. Any last questions before I stop there? Yes, sir. An element that I see specifically absent in your discourse sure. is the fact that we are not looking at what an element called the greed factor in this major yeah. situation, which at leaving the resources yeah. of uh, the LDCs, the least yeah. countries, right. and pouring that into the more economically developed yeah. countries. For example, mm -hmm. um, a coffee company, I'm not going to sure. name it, but it's buying coffee from Nicholson Dime, yeah. selling it for $4 or $5 a pound. Sure. The people who invest in corporate investment, these are the cleaners, the people who yeah. do not manufacture, they do not buy, they do not sell, they just invest. Right, right. And they buy stock in a product and then they, they skim the profits yeah. and they live in the large urban areas. Yeah. Where they sit behind a computer yeah. and, and, and tax by arm, um, they, they buy stuff. They never sweat. Yeah, yeah. Now, you have people in other countries who, if there was equality, there wouldn't be such a wide gap between the selling mm. final product price and the people who actually labor in these communities. Yeah. When you reduce the profit of these people or you keep their incomes down, they now must migrate to cities right, right, right. and they leave the urban areas and then you have automation sure. going in and high technology sure. which is now taking up M20 jobs in yeah. the farmland where people use hoes and things sure, 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 sure. So we have to look at the larger picture yeah. of the fairness in international policy yeah, to yeah. allow the gleaners to reap the resources and harvest the energy and sweat of smaller countries yeah. rather than providing them. Well, I mean, is it is it gleaning even? Is it just massive distribution, redistribution? So poor countries, many of the developing countries we're talking about, sub-Saharan Africa, they're sending money. Their net financial flows are money going to the rich countries, okay? It's not really in terms of aid going to poor countries. What's really going on is they're paying debt back to the rich countries. So we had a discussion here earlier about what happens when a country goes in debt and they have to borrow from the IMF to make ends meet. Well, they cut their schooling budget, and that money goes to finance debt in the rich countries. Countries. So if you want to take one issue, I mean, I absolutely agree with you that there are real exploitative qualities of global capitalism. I'm absolutely on board. I didn't push that issue too hard, but I would agree. But I would say that one of the really challenging issues is the fact that we have this massive debt crisis for developing countries. They owe a lot more, and the, the rich countries and the rich IGOs are collecting that debt. I think it's getting a little bit better over the past few years, partly because of the leadership of the European Union in forgiving debt. Okay? And they have to. I mean, they're going to have to forgive the de debt of developing countries because they're never going to get the money to begin with. And if they forgive that debt, what will happen is those governments in those developing countries will have more money for schools. Okay? So I'm absolutely on board with that. I think it is part of the story. It's part of the problem. Um, without, I'm totally out of time, so let me give you one last slide. I'll, put it, I'll turn it around. I, I would like to see less gleaning by the rich countries of profits from developing countries or labors from developing countries. But I also would like to see rich countries just transfer resources to developing countries. So one last slide in this regard, if I get there, bear with me, uh, is, has to do with aid. And if we look at one thing we could be doing much better is give to developing countries. So not only stop exploiting the developing countries, absolutely agree, but also just give more resources to developing countries. Um, and not just in terms of you know, having a local church 
give some money to some poor community in a poor country, but having our governments give. If you look at aid as a percent of our GDP, the United States is a real laggard. We're the 19th best, 19th best, despite being the richest country arguably in the history of the world. We're the 19th best in terms of giving aid as a percent of our economy to poor countries. We give about 0.6%, not 1%, 0.6%. So let six tenths of 1% of our country's GDP dedicated to aid the developing countries. Much of that is to our military allies in the Middle East and elsewhere and so forth. So when we really talk about giving to poor countries, we're way behind. By comparison, you can look at several of the Scandinavian countries that give at a rate about seven times greater than we do. Seven times greater. So they're giving 0.4% of their GDP. The United States, I'm sorry, is 0.06%. So six Six one hundredths of a percent. I keep mixing that up. It's so small, it's hard, hard to get it right. Six one hundredths of a percent, and by comparison, many other European countries are way ahead of that. So that's one way, even if we can't really fix a global capitalist economy that inherently exploits poor people. I think that's, that's been the case since the dawn of capitalism. But we could give more, and we don't. So that's one way in which we could see some progress. Okay, I'll stop there. All right, thank you.